Good morning and welcome to World Dairy Expo 2013. Digistar is pleased to bring you Say What? Your opportunity to, for today's social, to tell your social media story. We are uh, brought today by Digistar, but the speakers are Michelle Payne Knopper, moderator of Cause Matters Corp, Carrie Mess of DairyCarry.com, and Emily Zweiber of Zweiber Family Farms, and David Foster of Foster Family Farms. Very good. Well, thank you, Robin. We certainly appreciate it. Good morning to everyone. You came in out of the rain, right? That's a good thing. So let me ask you this. How many of you think social media is a fad that is going away? How many of you wish it would go away? Uh huh. Yeah, so uh, here's your little reality check. You remember how you felt about email probably 20 years ago? Yeah, well, that's kind of the same deal. Social media is not going away. I think we all understand um, that there are some real challenges with it, but there are, are also a lot of opportunities. The sheer numbers when you look at it is there's 1.2 billion people on Facebook today. You don't have 1.2 billion people that you can communicate with at the end of the driveway, do you? However, when you look at social, we certainly have those opportunities. There's 400 million tweets that are sent out a day. There's 100 hours of YouTube video that actually have been uploaded since I started talking. So what that bodes as far as agriculture, and these numbers should be in your handout. I'm going to steal your handout right here. Um, the flip side of that is there's a lot of, of negative information out there about food and agriculture and farming. Um, when you look at what the activists have done and the numbers are on here and the fact that there's been a 350-fold increase on Twitter from the Humane Society following um, since 2009 is a very scary statistic to me as a Holstein breeder. I don't know how you all feel, but I think that I have the right to tell my story more effectively than any activist ever could do that. And we have three great panelists today that also share those <coughs> feelings and have a lot of experiences. So we're going to go ahead um, and introduce them. But we really wanted to get a sense from the people in the room about where you are on social media and kind of get a baseline so we can um, make our remarks accordingly. So let's see. How many of you are on Facebook? You want to throw your hands up in the air? And how many of you post every day about your farm on Facebook? OK. Considerably <laughs> yeah, loud wait. and proud. That's <laughs> awesome. How many of you put pictures on Instagram about your farm? All right. Um, and by the way, when I say farm, for those of you that work in the egg services to support farmers, you can certainly include yourselves in that. How many people in here blog, please? All right. And how about tweet? How many people are on Twitter? How many people get Twitter? <laughs> All right. And let's see, what about Pinterest? Someday. Do we have any man penners that are willing to admit that they're? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. And how many women? Oh, we've got one that are point. Right? Somebody needs to raise. Uh, he's hiding back there. We've got a man penner in the crowd. How many ladies are addicted to Pinterest? <laughs> and here's the big one. How many of you are comfortable with putting a video on YouTube? Oh, very good. I'm proud. That's awesome. So there you go, panelists. That gives you a sense of where people are. Did I miss any big ones? OK. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists without any further ado here. We have three great people who have been very actively involved in social media um, for several years now. The first one is Carrie Mess, and Carrie is actually not originally from a farm. She grew up just three miles away from here, right? Right. And um, she milks cows over by Watertown. Right. Um, and she has a blog, and she said that her blog has gone beyond her wildest dreams. Um, and so. She's been engaged um, in a number of efforts over the last few years and has been having a lot of fun lately with some of the claims that the food service business is making. So Carrie, if you want to uh, spend just a few minutes talking about what you really think is important, then we'll move on to Emily and David. Sure. So like Michelle said, I grew up three miles from here. I don't have grandparents that farm. Um, I met and married the son of a dairy farmer, and my life totally changed. Um, I found my passion. So. When I found this and started getting um, out there, I was in Facebook already. Um, and I was kind of into Twitter already. But I wanted to just you know, share stuff that I thought was really cool as I learned. So I started doing that, and people responded. Um, my friends list is made up of a lot of people who have no ag background, because that's how I started. You know, your, your high school friends and all that, they don't necessarily know about the farm. So. Um, when I started, I thought, well, we'll do this, we'll do that. And, and I got on Twitter um, for a totally different reason. I'll make you guys laugh. I used to sell online um, lingerie. <laughs> she really did. I really did. So, she you know. She lingerie and cows. And they're really not that far apart because. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, honey, 
I, yeah, never mind. Well, dairy air in dairy air. Come on, right? Ha ha. We're being recorded, remember? Right. <laughs> so this is how I, I got launched in. But what I found is this really great community of farmers out there. Um, farmers that were on Twitter, and they were really helpful to me as I was learning. I could say, you know what, I want to know more about this. I'd go out on Twitter, and I'd say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? I asked Emily a lot of questions. Um, and like, help me with this calf thing that I'm working through. So there was this really great um, amount of information coming in. Um, and then as I grew and the blog happened and, and I just started writing and people started reading my stuff, I still don't know why you do it, but thank you. Um, I started getting a lot of people saying, you know, I'm kind of afraid to do what you do. Um, I'm afraid of the animal rights activists coming and burning down my barn. And it's a very real fear, but at the same time, I would rather be put out of business in that sense than be put out of the business because they turned my customers against me. So that was the biggest motivator for me to get out there and tell our story, um, the story of our farm, uh, the story of my, my uh, in-laws and our family and our cows. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. You know, it's <laughs> interesting looking across this panel because I don't know how many years we've been connected now, several. Mm -hmm. Um, we all met because of Ag Chat, which is a weekly conversation that happens on Twitter. And ironically, the next person is the first and only executive director of the Ag Chat Foundation, our first employee. She's been doing an awesome job. But more importantly to you, she is a dairy producer and a proud mom of three little kids. Um, and she actually has an organic farm. And it's been really interesting to add to the conversation, um, as you can imagine, as dairy producers, the challenges that perhaps we could say we have in working together maybe, just a little bit, um, whether it's large versus small or traditional versus organic. And, and I think Emily provides a very balanced voice of reason to that. Um, she has been actively engaged in social media, um, both a personal and a professional level. So she brings just a little bit different perspective to it. And I've never heard her talk about selling lingerie, but maybe there's something you've got going with Carrie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with that. I'm out of the biz. <laughs> Poor Emily. Mm -hmm. I won't tell the story about how, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so. Uh, well, thank you, Michelle. Uh, my story is similar in a way, but a little bit different as well. I did not grow up on a dairy farm either and married into the, the industry. So to me, every day when I go out on the farm, I've been with my husband 13 years now, and it's still every day out on the farm is something new. I'm asking the dumb questions. And to me, that has always uh, turned into what our consumers are probably asking those questions as well. You know, uh, my husband, he's doing this every day, and he doesn't think of those things that people might be looking at it at a different you know, viewpoint. Our blog, um, blogging um, was the first way I got into social media, specifically for my farm. Um, I had been, I'm kind of a social media addict. I joined MySpace right when it opened in 2000. I hacked onto Facebook before it was open to the public using my husband's. You're a cheater then. Yeah, his <laughs> university account, because my school didn't, wasn't on Facebook yet. But um, so I've been using uh, social media since 2000, but really actively for our farm since 2009. Um, we, in addition to the dairy, we also have a, a direct meat market business. So uh, we started our blog just to uh, share recipes on cuts that people weren't familiar with. So we also sell beef, pork, and chicken. And no one knew how to cook a pork chop with a bone on it. That's a really bizarre thing to most people. And so that's why I, I had started our blog. Uh, six months later, the Cochrane Dairy um, undercover videos happened. And that was the first time I actually blogged um, about something other than recipes. And it had a huge response, um, not just from farmers, but from our customers and people that weren't uh, connected to agriculture, really trying to understand um, what that abuse video meant, what it meant to our farm, to people that they had trusted as farmers that they were buying from. And so it, it really gave me a voice to be talking about what dairy farmers really do and, and that sort of thing. So that really changed my mindset back, and that was about two, early 2010, late mm -hmm. 2009 that happened. And ever since then, um, we've just, you know, have been using all the social media channels uh, to just to share about um, what we do on our farm. And it's, and it's not all of my things aren't just about dairy farming. I connect to people in a, a variety of ways. Um, I'm a mom. Like Michelle said, I have three young kids. So it's oftentimes I'm talking to people about being a mom and, and what that all means and being a working mom, too. You know, um, that you know, brings a whole different um, element to it. And 
Um, that's how I connect with people first, and the dairy part is kind of second, and they find out that I'm a dairy farmer, and then they trust me as either a mom or whatever first, and are able to ask me questions about our farm. Um, like Michelle said, we're an organic farm, and I hope, I try to be the voice of reason, kind of that middle, but there, there's just so many extremes, but um, I, you know, I, my rule is I don't want to throw any dairy farmers under the bus. We are all working together to produce a wholesome product, and your farm probably looks different than my farm, and your farm looks different than the person you're sitting next to, and that's okay, because we all bring different things to the table, and we can talk about um, all the great things that we do bring to the table without putting anybody else down. So that's um, really what we strive to do um, in our social media presence. I, I do the blog and the Facebook, and my husband actually does Twitter. I do Twitter personally, but if you follow Weber Farms, that is not my voice. So <laughs> you will notice. That. She is at Ease Weber. Yes, and my husband is Weber Farms. Yes, and real quick on the back of your sheets for everybody's information um, are all of our social handles on Twitter and Facebook and the blogs too. So don't feel like you have to try to spell any of our names. Yeah. Okay. So that that's pretty much my story of how we got started and what our mission, I guess, is in social media. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, next up, we have, as you can see, the testosterone representative up here. Um, and, and <laughs> Please don't ask if I do anything with lingerie. <laughs> I, I actually was not going to go there, but since you did, a man wearing purple nonetheless. Uh, no. There's a reason. Yes. A good one. yes, of course. It's the Kansas connection, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Very good. Next up is David Foster, and I'll let David tell you a little bit um, about himself. But he is uh, heavily involved across the, the business, National Milk Producers Federation. Um, let's see, DMI you're involved with, Farm Bureau, all sorts of good activities, right? Yep. Um, very proud father of three girls. One could probably discuss what your estrogen levels are going to be in your household <laughs> in 10 years, but you probably don't want to go there. <laughs> but I hope that you're raising girls that want a dairy farm. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, yes, I, I, I am proud of my family um, and my three girls, and uh, I have my wife here, so half of our labor force at Foster Dairy is actually my mom. Sorry. Whoa. I was going to say, um, where's your wife? Yeah. <laughs> Let me back up there. Anyway, uh, uh, half of our labor force from Foster Dairy is here at the World Dairy Expo. That makes it very difficult on my dad and our one employee that we've had for seven years now. Um, I was born and raised uh, in southeast Kansas near Fort Scott um, and you know, just heavily involved uh, my whole life in the, the dairy operation and for some reason I decided that that's, that's where I wanted to live the rest of my life and uh, pursue a career in. Um, sometimes I scratch my head on that because uh, you know, dairy farming is a, a tough industry to be a part of. But uh, what, what really got me uh, motivated in you know, the social media realm, it was pretty a natural uh, you know, thing for me to get into because I've always had a, an extreme interest in technology. Uh, we had, you know, I was raised with computers in the home, uh, had internet, and um, you know, uh, I uh, went to Kansas State Community College or Kansas State University uh, mm -hmm. after going to my local uh, Fort Scott Community College. And, uh, you know, I worked with a communications department there, created, you know, DVDs and uh, worked on websites. And, um, you know, uh, I, I kind of like Emily, uh, I was, uh, you know, one of those early adopters of things. And I remember it being college book or something like that before it actually was called Facebook, I think. I still remember it being blue. But anyway, uh, it was always very interesting to me to uh, connect with other people and, uh, that that just you know kept evolving as the technology evolved as more people uh, you know adopted that and um, I, I probably have been most comfortable with Twitter but as of late uh, I, I guess I see myself I feel myself kind of moving back over to you know Facebook and you know there's times where I just get flat burnt out on social media and you know I just uh, you know, the, the things that have been, you know, going on on the daily operation of the farm, they bog you down and, you know, you ask yourself, do you have time to, to mess with this stuff uh, because there's so much stress involved in the daily operations of, you know, producing that, that milk and that product. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I find that it's very uh, important. And so I, I 
make myself, and, and I, I like taking pictures, so I make myself try to regularly stay involved. Uh, one of my biggest faults uh, is that because of the daily operation, um, I, I don't read a whole lot um, about, uh, you know, and some of that means that I'm dropping off on the social aspect of the social media. Uh, my forte is, you know, trying to post things regularly um, on Twitter and Facebook, but I, I don't read and I, I don't uh, do a lot of that because most of the time my access to, uh, you know, those outlets is my phone and usually it's in the feed room while I'm waiting for feed to run into a wagon or to mix up or something like that. So sure. that's kind of my background and okay. I'll, I'll turn it back over to Michelle. All right, great. Well, thank you. Um, why don't we run down the row real quick just so people can get a, a feel and tell us all the tools, the, all the social um, channels that you're on as well as what perhaps your favorite tool is. So since on I On or active? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's start with on, I think the active. Um, and since I didn't prep you guys for that, I will start real quick just to, to give you a couple minutes to prepare. So um, I blog, I have a YouTube channel. I, I have a website, obviously. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and I'm missing Pinterest, which I'm not very active on. Um, and my favorite tool was TweetDeck, and I've not yet recovered from the demise of TweetDeck. So, uh, yeah, and my, I will tell you, my office manager loves Hootsuite, swears by Hootsuite, but I just can't do it. So that would be mine. Carrie? All the same. <laughs> um, blogging, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, I personally, well, I like my blog. I like the interactions I have there, but I've really gravitated back towards my Facebook page. Um, I can page or profile? Um, my page, probably, um, my personal profile, I, I interact too, but my page is my favorite because I have a lot of really great conversations there. And define great conversations. Um, about 60% of my followers on my page are probably people in the ag industry, whether they're from dairy or not. Um, but a good 40% of my followers um, have no ag background. So I post a lot of photos from our farm. I um, tell stories about what's going on on the farm. Um, I just share fun stuff. And so um, I get a lot of questions back. I get a lot of messages back of people asking me, what about this? I heard about that. Did you see this article? Um, and we can really have great conversations um, beyond, as we call it always, beyond the choir, beyond sure. the, the farmers in the room. Um, great. And in, not in 140 characters. Okay, Emily? Yeah, uh, same thing. I'm not very active on LinkedIn, so if you request an invitation to j connect with me, it probably will sit there for three months, sorry. It's not that I'm ignoring, I just don't use LinkedIn as much. Uh, Google Plus um, a little bit as well, oh, just yeah. for, for SEO, yeah, that's um, good. search engine optimization for our blog. That's the main reason I use Google Plus and to find out with what four farmers that I do follow on Google Plus are doing. <laughs> that there's um, my favorite tool. I've grabbed, I, I used to be a, a huge Twitter fan. I have moved mm -hmm. back to um, Facebook as well. Blogging is, will always be my favorite. I like to write. Okay, David? Um, I, I don't blog, um, and otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm, I have an account on many of those uh, Pinterest, Instagram, and Oh, and so you are a man pinner. I try to throw up a picture sometimes or maybe a link, but I'm not very active on that. Uh, my two primary ones has always been, you know, the Twitter and the Facebook. And uh, like I said, sometimes you, you migrate from focusing on one and then back to the other. Sure. Yeah. Um, in the interest of clarification, because I know in some of the groups that I work with, people have no idea what Instagram or Pinterest are. Um, just by way of clarification, Pinterest is actually a virtual bulletin board more or less where it captures pictures. It's approximately 80% dominated by females. Um, it's of interest perhaps to you because of the fact that recipe and food information um, is a substantial part of it. It actually has higher engagement levels and drives more retail traffic than either Facebook or Twitter did when it was at the same age of Pinterest. And you can go to Pinterest.com. On your handouts, you'll see each of the tools that we talk about um, have their own section with several different reference links and whatnot, and that's there um, for you to be able to take home and, and to be able to use. Instagram is actually now owned by Facebook, right? I got that right. Um, just had the founder on the t TV this morning, um, and they really designed Instagram for people to be able to share photos and make it be beautiful and easy. 
And you know, I kind of blew off Instagram, to be honest with you. I was on it for a while, and then at the Ag Chat Foundation conference, one of the food panelists that we had went out, she said that she was a mom, she was intimidated to talk to farmers because she thought you were all so smart, and she wasn't. So she gets her food information and her recipes from Instagram. Opportunity is what I heard. Um, so those are some, and then Google Plus, um, I think it's been out long enough, most people are familiar with it. it. This is not going to sound very nice, and the techies in the room won't like this, but my definition in Google Plus is it's Google's want to be a Facebook, is basically some of what it is. And, and there's some different things that they, they do on there. So that is, I think, a capture of all the tools that we talked about that may not be familiar. Um, what we're going to do is go ahead and move into questions. The remainder of our time today will be questions. Um, I'll pose a few to get everybody warmed up, and then hopefully there will be some from the audience. So if you have some questions, and any question is perfectly acceptable, you know, as they say, no question is a dumb question. So um, please be prepared. We've got some great expertise up here in the room, and I know they will be happy to help you with it. So one of the things that we talk about in agriculture is really going beyond the choir. It seems like we're really good at patting ourselves in the back amongst ourselves, but we're not so great at reaching the 98.5% of the population that's not on a farm or ranch. So can you um, tell me, how do you go beyond the choir in your social efforts? Um, for me, I try to reach out beyond the, the ag industry um, via my blog by, first of all, I don't just talk about the farm. I mean, the farm is my life, obviously. It's all encompassing. But you can have some hobbies, or at least interests, even if you don't act on them. Um, I talk a lot about music. I love music. I love live music. Um, so that's one of the things um, I'm sure Emily will talk about sharing recipes is a great way to bring uh, people in that have no connection to the farm. Um, and just, you know, talk about your life beyond the farm and, and you'll have things in common. We're not, you know, so totally isolated that we don't have anything in common with um, non-farm people. So do you feel like you've been successful in reaching beyond the choir? I think so. I How do. do you measure that? Um, just by the conversations I have. The other day I um, got a friend request on Facebook from somebody. I had no idea who they were. They had seven friends in common though, and the seven friends that we have in common are people that I'd met um, in Milwaukee via Twitter. They have no ag background, but I really didn't understand why this guy was friending me. Um, but then I got a message from one of my friends in common said, accept this request. Well, it turns out he was having a conversation about raw milk. And so they wanted somebody with some knowledge about the dairy industry to kind of come in and talk about, um, you know, this or that and, and how this all works together. So that was great. Great. Um, I w I'll share some three practical ways that I do. Um, first off, in my intro, I said I, I talk about mom and being a mom a lot. So that's um, one way. So on our blog, um, we, we do recipes once a week, and I pin those to Pinterest. And that drives a lot of traf um, non-farm traffic to our blog. I think that's one of our not our biggest drivers for non-agriculture um, traffic to our blog is our recipe postings. Um, but there's not a lot of engagement there. I mean, people are coming, they're looking at the recipe, they're making it, they maybe pin it to their page and then or their you know their their pin board and then they move on. So there's not a lot of engagement there. But I check the other pages that they're also looking at once they've come to our um, blog and they're checking about our family farm. They're, you know, they're, ta they're looking at all the different things that we have on tabs up there to really drive people to, to learn about dairy. So that um, is encouraging to me. On Twitter, um, I've actually gotten really involved with the Holistic Moms Network on Twitter. They have a chat directly after Egg Chat, so it's very convenient. I'm chatting on Egg Chat Tuesday nights, and then the Holistic Moms is an hour afterwards. And I've become known as the dairy farmer. Um, on there, and of course, as the name um, suggests, holistic moms are really thinking that these are people that are really have a lot of questions about food, uh, what they're feeding their children, what they're feeding their family, and to be kind of that voice of a farmer, someone who's actually doing it day to day, um, has been very helpful um, to them. And a lot of them have become um, friends of mine, not only just online but it, um, offline as well. So that's been a good way to connect. And then on Facebook, uh, one thing that we do with our farm page, not my personal profile, but our farm page is I interact with other pages that I know that people, um, that we want to connect with, that we know we want to reach out to. So for me, it's uh, Minneapolis, we're just 30 minutes south of Minneapolis, has a really good um, food, foodie blogger um, 
culture there. So I'm interacting with these foodie bloggers um, via our farm page. So it's Weber Farms that's um, connecting with them, and hopefully that you know we we connect back and forth that way. And uh, it's been really great to um, connect to those those bloggers in that way. So as you connect with the foodie bloggers, do you feel like they have a genuine interest in talking with any kind of farmer, um, or do you feel like they only want one certain type of message, or where do you? Feel that connection is coming from? You know, honestly, I think they probably um, connect with us because we are organic, mm -hmm. but that is a chance for me to say, you know what, all farmers do that. And so that's my opportunity to, um, you know, spread that message a little bit more. Okay. Great. How about you, David? Uh, to echo what the, my fellow panelists have already said, uh, I just feel like the most important thing is for me to be relatable. Uh, to my audience period. I, I may not uh, actively uh, try to engage in uh, you know, other uh, categories, other avenues, um, but uh, I, you know, I, sometimes whether it be taboo or not, I, I'm pretty passionate about family values or politics or you know, uh, some of those things where I might post some stuff like that that, you know, that might turn some people off, but at the same time I'm trying to be true to who I am and uh, you know my my values and my beliefs and I'm always trying to you know be relatable I've got so many diverse interests uh, whether it be learning how to take private pilot lessons or um, you know uh, watching a certain show on TV or you know going to a concert or anything like that you know I don't want to you know you want to be relatable to your audience and so I don't want to just hide that but most of everything that I do because that, you know, is my whole life is, you know, all dairy or, you know, most of my pictures are from the farm and, and all that. So, yes, when you have followers uh, that, that are non-farm followers, uh, you may have no idea, uh, you asked about being, uh, you know, measurable, you have no idea whether, you know, they're following or they see that picture or, or not, but then... Uh, when I'm at a conference, you know, somewhere else happened just the other day and they come up to me and, oh, I really enjoy, uh, you know, following along your pictures and your posts and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, you don't have a like, you don't have a comment, you know, I call them creepers, but, you know, yeah. it's because <laughs> you have no idea that Lurkers. they're there, Lurkers. but Lurkers. You know, the stalkers, whatever. It is fascinating, particularly how pictures and videos play, because yeah. if you're not aware of photos and videos, particularly on Facebook, um, go higher into the feed. And so you basically have more people who are getting impressions. Um, it's fascinating the comments that you get even six months, a year after you post something. Whereas you said, David, people may not like it, they may not do anything with it, but they'll say to you a year later, oh, I saw when you were out in the barn with your daughter and you were doing this, and I thought that was really cool. And I look at them, I said, well, when was that? They said, oh, last summer sometime. Yep. So the impression that we're able to leave about farms and families is so critical. But one of the things that I think you heard as a common denominator up here is that they all approach it from a human level first. How many of you think that what you do is you milk cows and that's all that you do? Good. Yeah. The, the reality is, is if we're going to be able to relate to the rest of the population, we need to do it on human values. And these three are a great example of that. So I'm going to ask one more question. Um, and then we'll turn it over, see if the audience has any. But let me just ask the audience this real quick first, if you guys don't mind. How many of you think you don't have time to do all of this? Okay, fair enough. Um, how many of you have a smartphone? And you know how to use it? <laughs> the other question I had to ask for clarification. Um, so let's go ahead, because I understand from working um, with lots of dairy producers and working with farmers of all types across the country, there's a lot of people that don't think they have time for this. I get that. My question back to you is when will you have time? When the next nasty video comes out? When PETA is more than happy to talk about how you're abusing your animals? Or when dehorning becomes the consumer issue that we all know it's likely to? Will you have time then? Because if you have time then, you probably need to have time now and to approach it from a more proactive basis than a reactive basis. So I'll turn to our panel and, and ask, um, you know, we all know dairy producers are busy people. Obviously a lot don't think they have time for this. So um, what do you do to maximize your efficiency and your impact? And let's start with David. Yeah. Well, my time management is probably my worst, <laughs> my worst uh, attribute. Well, do you as... spend five hours on social media? No. Ten minutes? No, I, I, probably, I probably spend ten minutes a day, uh, maybe at most, I would say, on average, uh, because some days 
you know, you're just so engulfed in trying to get your activities done on the farm and, uh, you know, but like I said, uh, if, if I take the time, uh, I've found that my best time uh, is in the feed room while I'm mixing feed. And, and on your operation, it's going to be completely different. Uh, you know, if you're getting up and you're usually pulling up the DTN to check some, uh, you know, forecasts or the weather or something like that, can you not also, you know, pull up your uh, smartphone and, and make a post about what your plans are for the day or whatever? But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I just feel like it's important to, to take a little bit of time, and that's all I try to do. Sure. Mm -hmm. on, on our farm, we do value uh, social media as a risk management tool, so we have a different mindset about it. It's not just an extra thing to do. It's actually part of our risk management strategy for our farm. So I think having that mindset um, allows you to spend some time there versus just feeling that it's this frivolous extra thing you need to do. Um, so I'm very lucky that um, everybody on our operations views social media that way. Um, but for me, busy, working mom, three kids, farm, all that stuff. Um, you know, having the smartphone is really helpful for me. So I can share photos from our farm uh, on Facebook. I used to blog three, uh, three days a week. I have since, um, since school has started, <laughs> one day a week. And, and, that's, and that's fine. You know, it, it's... There's blogs out there that uh, do really well and blog one time a month. So you just need to find what works for you, but being consistent, I think, is the key to that. Um, Facebook, I try to post uh, every single day, but it's usually just a photo and, or a question out to our consumers or something that really only takes you know, five, 10 minutes to do. Sure. I look at it, again, on our farm as just a very important thing. I can feed my cows. Um, and I do social media, they're, they're the two things that, you know, go together. They're just as important. Don't you milk them? Well, I milk too, but yeah. So, but the, 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 it's important to feed my cows as it is to use social media, that's ah, gotcha. how I should have said okay. that. Um, because I need our story and our message to get out there. It needs to happen. Um, because if we don't have it, it doesn't get out and everybody else's version does. But for me, um, honestly, how long does it take to snap a photo? 10 seconds if you like focus. Um, and if we have smartphones, then you click share, Facebook, type, 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 done. How long? I mean, it doesn't take long. Almost every calf born on our farm gets its photo put up on my Facebook page. It really does. And it annoying. really does. And, and if you don't like annoying. crossbreds, it's really annoying. I think they're cute. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to, from now on, actually just send them right to Michelle. I'll take the extra 15 seconds to do that. But almost every calf goes up on my Facebook page. And yeah, you know, you guys see calves all the time. And it's like, oh, well, that one's kind of cute, whatever. But there's so many people who don't, and I get so many followers who are like, oh my god, this calf is so cute. Yeah. It took me 15 seconds yeah. to take a picture and put it up. Um, so you just pause. And we all need to pause sometimes <laughs> in life, honestly. Pause. Appreciate that you have a really cute calf here, and it's alive. <laughs> Share it. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to touch on uh, something that Carrie touched on is that a lot of times when I'm talking to other farmers or other neighbors and they're like, you know, what's the big deal? And, you know, I just respond to that, that uh, I'm not posting these pictures. I'm not posting these status updates about what I'm doing this morning and, you know, that we're going to bale hay or anything like that because it isn't any big deal to the neighbor down the road. You know, they've already been done with theirs two weeks ago most of the time. But, <laughs> That's because they're not on Twitter. But, <laughs> but I'm not posting most of my content out there for that audience. Right. I'm posting it for a different audience. Well, and it's amazing the conversations that it opens up because this just happened to me, I think, about a year and a half ago. I put a picture of um, my daughter and a 91-point cow. Up, and they'd had this special relationship because they'd been born within six months of each other. And it was a goodbye picture because we had to ship the cow because she wouldn't be back. Her uterus tipped over her pelvis, you know, the whole story. And yeah, it was a pretty sad day, obviously, when you've got to ship your favorite cow. But I put the picture up there. And what was most telling to me was my non-farm friends that were like, oh, that's so sad. And, and that's such a pretty cow. And, and I came back and said, yes, but you know what? My little girl understands that this is the purpose for animals. They died so that we can eat. 
And people would make a couple more remarks. I'd say, you know what? It's an honor and a privilege to care for these animals so that we can eat. Mm -hmm. And how many times do you have a conversation with people on a daily basis that animals die so we can eat? And that's OK. And that we do everything in our power to be able to take care of those animals. And it, it's very interesting, the conversations that open up when you take the risk of being able to share some of those types of um, pictures and, and discussions and so forth. So why don't we go ahead and open it up um, for questions to see, because we want to be sure we're going the direction that you guys um, want to go. Um, so if you want, have a question, we will only ask that you please um, state the question on the microphone, because this is being recorded. And if you want to tell us who you are and where you're from, we'd love to hear that too. So any questions? I know that there have to be a couple here. Feel more comfortable tweeting them there? Yeah. <laughs> Marilyn Hershey from uh, Cochranville, Pennsylvania. Um, what was the moment that you realized that uh, social media impacted your farm? Okay. Who wants to start with that? I wrote a blog about, um, <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite cow that died. And the response. That, Gosh, take a deep breath. You're okay. I'm not a crier. I'm not. I'm like a let's go have beer kind of person. Um, but I wrote a blog about my favorite cow that died. And it was really hard for me to put it out there. It was more therapy than anything else. But I have a couple hundred comments on that post of everybody saying, you know what? We're so sorry. So I shared the sad side of farming, just like you did. Um, and I got a really great response. I didn't get people saying, that's horrible. You have a cow that died, you know. The, they weren't focused on the death. They were focused on the care we gave. That's pretty great. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if I can answer that question. It's, it's just been kind of an evolving thing for us, but it, it's, it's fun when we go to non-agriculture events and people, especially my husband, uh, he's a big tweeter, tweets a lot about indie rock and music and we go to a lot of concerts together and people will say, hey, we follow you on Twitter, we love your cows, you know, and that kind of stuff. So that meeting people that you had no idea follow you in real life is kind of creepy at first, but then it, you think, yeah, there's, there's um, you know, we're doing something that people, it's impacting people's perceptions about but dairy farming. Doesn't he have a lot of romance novelists? That he also has a lot of romance novelists. Yes, yeah. he was featured. You both yeah. were featured in a book. Yes. In Australia. Yeah. We're really big in Australia. <laughs> we don't want to know the details. <laughs> okay, David. <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, what one of the first things uh, that you know really made me enjoy a social media. I'm not. I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but. Uh, in our area, I mean, in Kansas, there's less than 300 uh, grade A dairies in the state. Uh, we're now 40 miles from the nearest dairy, uh, bes you know, and uh, so I was already feeling pretty isolated, especially as a young dairyman. Uh, you know, the only times I would get to meet and talk to other dairymen or other young dairymen was online. And uh, the camaraderie that mm -hmm. kind of uh, developed off of uh, posting online. Uh, I remember one of my first posts where Will Gilmer, you know, kind of retweeted and said, yeah, I agree with that, as uh, I was feeding the, the baby calves and uh, the calf flipped the bottle, uh, the nipple up and uh, it splashed milk all over my glasses. And it was one of those hot days and I was like, I hate it, I tweeted, I hate it when I get milk on my glasses, you know, just one of those venting type of moments because of course, you know, it just doesn't wipe off, you know, it, it takes some work <laughs> to get milk off of your glasses. And so, you know, then to have uh, Will Gilmer in Alabama, you know, retweet that and said, yeah, I, I, I don't like that either, you know, it's just like, that was the first thing that, you know, really is like, yeah, see, I'm not alone. Yeah. And so that that's one of the first things for me that uh, on the, the farm side, the sure. camaraderie that, you know, kind of developed online as well is, you know, important. So Yeah, that has been one thing that's been very interesting to witness is the community that's really formed. You know, obviously we want to go beyond the choir, but there's value to sharing best practices and venting and sharing issues because sometimes farming can be a really lonely business. And yes, this can help, believe it or not. I won't get into my transition venting, transition plan. <laughs> Let's not here. do that right now. We can do that later. All right, next question. 
Hi, I'm Rayanne Frizzle from Prince Edward Island, Canada. And I am wondering what is the worst mistake that you have made using social media? I can start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready for that one. <laughs> well, my first, uh, when I first got on Twitter and I connected my Twitter and Facebook account, and I can't even say exactly what I tweeted, but um, I was think I'm, I'm always one of those, I like the shock factor uh, value, and I only had like, six followers on Twitter and so I was thinking uh, oh they're gonna really get a good kick out of this they're gonna really laugh about this and so I put some kind of you know shock factor type of comment up and then I realized after the fact after I started getting a bunch of comments on Facebook that oh yeah I had my accounts connected and that went to all of my Facebook followers too when I was thinking my audience was only you know six or seven people uh, that were following on you know Twitter so uh, that was my first you know big wake-up call you know, you just got to know how the technology works yeah. uh, when you're going to, you know, get into using it. Yep. Yeah, not realizing your mother-in-law follows your Twitter account even though she's not on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emily, <laughs> how much venting have you done? <laughs> not recently. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, this is recorded, so no. I'll stop. <laughs> but most of my mistakes, um, I've, I've learned that, especially with my blog posts, um, I'm a big typo person, and that doesn't bother me so much, but just making sure that my facts about things are correct. I've, I've, there's some blog posts that I've had to go back and, and re, redo things um, because my husband goes, that's not right. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's what you told me. He's like, no, that's not right. So, um, you know, just there's been some of those that I've had to correct. Sure. Um, on occasion, I've let commenters push my buttons. No. No. <laughs> really? You shouldn't tell people to take their meds. It's not nice. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> um, sometimes people can push my buttons a little, a little far, but I am also a very real person. Uh, what you see is what you get online and in person, um, and there's a value to that, yeah. but um, you should maybe filter just a little. Yeah, that authenticity is important, but taking the high road and representing farmers, not he, that you haven't. By he any really stretch. deserved it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it. Take the high road. Pretty yeah, I would sure say that that's one thing road. is when, when you're, you know, really mad about something or passionate, uh, I would be better off, you know, waiting to make any type of Walk comment. Away yeah, exactly. From the keyboard. Uh, no different than any type of argument face to face uh, yeah. because that's basically permanent and out there for everybody. But. Yeah, I use, my, my biggest thing is I'll tweet it, but I won't send it, and I'll put it in my drafts mm. and hold on to it for a couple hours. That's wise. I should try that maybe sometimes. <laughs> All right, other question. I know there was one in the back early on. Yeah. Way back. She had her hand way up, so it must be a burning question. Mm -hmm. I know her. She's, she's an intern. Yeah, I know her. Thank you. Oh, I have two questions. Number one, um, a lot of what you talk about is like the calf is born and you tweet about it. How much time do you take scheduling out what you do? Do you have like uh, an idea in advance about when you want to tweet what you talk about? And then the second question is, I know a lot of what you said is how personal your accounts are and you're keeping it real of what you are. What advice do you have for a company? So like us on Facebook is on here for Digistar. Um, they're not a person. How do they become relatable to their audiences. Yeah. Hi, Andrea. She used to be an intern on our farm. Oh, very good. <laughs> That's trouble for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I run both my Dairy Care page, and I'm also the social media manager for Dairy Business Communications. So I run their Facebook page, too. Um, so I try to make things interesting on both pages. On Dairy Business, I do quite a bit of scheduling ahead because I'm putting information, articles, things like that out there. On Dairy Carry, I put up what I come across in a day when I find it um, or what I want to share. Um, some days I don't share very much because like, it was a boring day. Um, but as acting as a business in a business page, um, you can't just push your own content constantly. You need to share other people's content. You need to keep it lighthearted and fun. There is nothing. There are two things that are the key to social media. Humor and cats. <laughs> you share that cats. stuff. <laughs> yeah, you share that stuff, and um, 
you know, keep it fun. Keep, give it a, people a reason to want to share your information or comment on your information. So if it's just boring, dry stuff, good luck. But that's part yeah, of your personality, too, because if right. David started sharing cat pictures, people would wonder what was going on. Oh, I don't share cat pictures, happen. really. <laughs> <laughs> not too many. Um, similar story. Um, for, for our blog, um, I, I know in advance June is dairy month, you know, July is ice cream month, you know, those type of things I know I want to focus on, and so I'll kind of start gathering um, stuff for that to share. Uh, you know, around the holidays, um, cooking with butter and, and, you know, I'll create recipes that are, you know, using butter and, and cookies, you know, holiday cookies and that sort of thing. So that kind of stuff. Um, you know what's happening on your farm. You know when harvest is going to be. You know when planting is going to be. Uh, you know, all those big events. You can kind of get those ideas, start typing them up, especially for a blog, and get them just, you know, drafted and ready to go. And then when you have the pictures of actually you doing that event, you just have to plug it in and it, it can go off. So that's, um, that's what I do for blogging. I've also now scheduled a time to blog versus just scheduling a time that I want my blog to be posted. And so then I have a more focused time to write. For me right now, it's Thursday's nap time. That's the only time I have to write. And if that gets shot, then we don't have a blog post that week. And that's just the way it happens. Uh, Facebook, Kind of the same thing. Um, I, I run some uh, business accounts as well, so the, a lot of those things do get scheduled. With our farm page, it's um, pictures of the day, what's happening. And if there isn't any picture, then I, I put out a question um, to our to our audience um, and that way. And then Twitter for me, nothing is scheduled. It's just as is. Okay. Anything to add, David? Uh, I don't schedule anything. Um, I can go two weeks without <laughs> saying a post, and then all of a sudden. Uh, you know, it's like my brain's going like this, and I'll basically blow up your, you know, news feed or, or whatever with a whole bunch of tweets at once, and I'm getting everything out, you know, in a big blast. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really schedule. I, I like to take pictures, at, and I post them immediately as I'm doing it. You know, if it's sunset and I'm still chopping hay, that's the picture, you know, I take and I post then. Uh, I guess that's what I like about the real time uh, of you know the social media aspect sure. as far as answering your questions on businesses of course it makes a difference on you know what kind of business you are but uh, I guess for me personally when I'm looking at what accounts I want to follow and what makes them valuable um, uh, I, one if all you do is retweet you know or you know repost other content from other people's pages that's one extreme I feel like, well, why do I need to follow you? I can just follow all of those other uh, accounts instead. There's no value to that. So I like the original content. Um, I'm one of those that if I don't get my news uh, from the feed room or whatever, if I don't get my news on my phone, which means uh, via social networks or my e-newsletters, uh, when I'm checking my email, then I don't get it. I don't pick up a paper or a publication, a physical hard copy. I, I check it on my time when sure. I feel uh, uh, so, um, you know, having, you know, news uh, like that and, and stuff like that, I feel like that's valuable as well for businesses. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't answer the business part of that. And I think it's, well, I always have the rule of thirds for our, our business account. So it's a third of original content, a third uh, sharing other people's content, and a third of your time should be spent just conversing with other people online. So just kind of think of it that way so it's not just heavy sell, sell, sell. And also remember who your audience is. I mean, if you are um, with a dairy genetics company and your audience might not be the general consumers, it might just be dairy farmers. So make, you know, focus your content to fit um, your audience versus trying to just get everybody. You know, just remember who your audience is and focus for that and that makes it a lot easier. Yeah. And I would just add from the business standpoint, because I know there's several business folks in here that have that question, um, to really look at who your community is that you're serving and build your social media presence around that accordingly. So to be a resource to them, which as Emily pointed out, is to be able to not only share your own content, but share other people's content as well. Um, and I will just add real quickly, um, as far as scheduling, I actually am very heavily scheduled with the exception of my personal Facebook profile. Um, and that's just because uh, I, it's more business than it is personal for me. Um, I would love to be online all the time, but when I'm on an airplane, it's a little impossible to be having a conversation. So, question. 
Um, I'm Rose Kuhn from Ontario, and I like to describe a uh, case scenario, and my question is, what would you say? So in this case, um, you have to go to uh, a meeting. It's a very large uh, audience. Uh, they are all non-agriculture. A large media is in attendance and a lot of delegation. You have uh, the, op the opportunity to speak for five minutes to promote the agriculture industry, and at the same time to make it very memorable. What would you say? <laughs> large audience, loaded question there. Large audience, mainstream media is present. What would you say? Five minutes, David, go. Well, I don't, I'm not going to give the five minute presentation. No, yeah, that's but, good. You don't have time. Um, <laughs> uh, again, keep it, keep it relatable. Uh, you know, everybody eats, uh, and everybody uh, is, uh, you know, uh, fascinated with food. And that would be my way to, you know, get over the barrier of I'm a farmer and everybody else here is not. Um, you know, and, and so that's where I would start. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that too, you know, um, whatever the, the conference is, maybe make a connection that way to dairy farming, but at the same time recognizing that all of us have choices in the room and the way that I choose to farm might not be the same as Carrie or David and that's okay and the, the products that you choose to eat may not be the same as mine and that's okay, but um, you know, that there's choices and we're offering you choices, so get to know, get to know your farmers. Um, and I would just focus on the fact that I'm not out to educate people, I'm out to tell my story. So I'm going to tell my farm story. I'm going to spend five minutes talking about what I do, why I do it. Mm -hmm. And I'd encourage you to put up a, a picture, an image, mm -hmm. um, and probably start asking the audience questions, because when you start asking the audience some questions, they engage with you. And if you're able to share the story, as Carrie said, it's not about education. Why do we have the right to educate the public? Don't we, in fact, have the right to have a conversation? Because you probably wouldn't like it much if people walked onto your farm and told you that you needed to be educated, would you? So let's not do that to them. All right, other questions? Uh, Lyle from Lombard, Illinois. Um, I understand. Um, the potential goodness of these types of services that we have. Um, I'm also um, wrestling with the whole idea of what the misunderstanding and the lethargic kind of treatment that agriculture gets in terms of our legislator process and our folks in Capitol buildings in Washington. Are they working today? Mm -hmm. Sorry, just had to ask. <laughs> Does it make a difference? It's a good point. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Anyhow, we digress. <laughs> and so I say, you know, maybe we're missing another opportunity, which is how do we get this kind of genuine information to these people who are making some of these decisions and shaping what the future of agriculture looks like? Okay, so you're specifically asking, how do we get information to elected officials? Is that what you're getting how do you towards? Get, how do you get connected with that audience, okay. which I think maybe is a pretty important audience? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, we, we do that, um, we do that um, intentionally with our farm um, social media networks as well. So we follow all of our uh, representatives, our senator, our senators, our representative and our senators um, on, on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, their Facebook pages as well, and we interact with them regularly from our farm fan page as well as our personal page so that we can have that with Emily Zwaber interacting with Amy Klobuchar versus Zwaber Farms too. And that's actually led to um, some of those um, folks coming out to our farm and doing tours. So it's, yeah. So you interact both from your profile and your, uh, your yeah. business page, okay? Yeah. Uh, pretty similar to Emily, uh, we, we have had uh, congressman, uh, congresswoman uh, uh, to our farm uh, to visit and then uh, I follow their accounts, I interact with them uh, both on Twitter and Facebook and you know you just try to, to keep, you're, you're basically trying to develop a relationship uh, with them so then uh, I mean uh, I think I've got a, a rela relationship now that uh, they regularly like or comment on things that I'm posting, and so you know that uh, you know they're reading it. Or even if it's their staff uh, people, uh, you know, a lot of that goes right up the line uh, to the congresswoman or, or a senator or whatever. And uh, because of our cooperative and some of the involvement I've been able to have there, I've been able to go to D.C. and meet with them in their office there 
multiple times in the last you know several years and farm bill has been a pretty big passion especially with dairy security act so and they all understand milk pricing of course right uh, there's <laughs> a few people in the world that really understand how milk is priced yes. <laughs> Um, just quickly, I have followers, so when I have an issue and I say, you know what, I want to put this out, I put this out to the people who follow me and they help. They raise the, the flag up the pole saying, hey, you know what, we want to know about this or we want input on this. So um, I can use my social media presence and my followers um, to leverage some attention. Very good. Next. We have, um, I will warn you, probably time for two more questions, maybe. And we'll stick around. Yes, we'll yeah. be glad to hang out afterwards, too. Hi, I'm Jen Bradley. I've been following you guys for a while, and I email you all these questions. Yeah. Well, my question is maybe unique to this audience. I don't know, and um, I really struggle with this. My, um, my dad still runs about 700 acres. He did sell the milk cows a couple years ago, but I have in-laws who are not. They're the natural news is gospel people, okay? And I've tried to think of ways to, like, if I, want, if I wanted to repost something, I mean, I have 400 friends on Facebook, a lot who aren't um, farm people, and I see an avenue there to promote the, the egg message, but I, I would meet with so much. You have no idea. It would be like family feud opposition. Mm -hmm. And I sit here. And I do nothing because I don't know what to do without causing a war. And I maybe this isn't the forum for this, but I need help with how to help you guys because I can't. I don't know what to do. Don't wage the war, wage the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Be respectful. Talk. Um, you're allowed to have your point of view. You can't pick your in-laws, right? You know. Um, but you gotta dip your toe in the water. I mean, I get a, all kinds of stuff in my feed from my in-laws that I don't agree with. They don't have any problem pushing their opinion on me. I, <laughs> Emily? Yeah, David? Go ahead. Go ahead. I have a vegan brother, so, you know, we're dairy farmers, he's vegan, that's like total nod. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally understand where you're at, and um, one thing practically that you could do is they're on Facebook, for example. You, could, you can now put people in the list. So you could structure your list so that they don't see those posts. And I can show you how to do that. Um, yeah, I'll show you how to do that afterwards. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um, and family is the most difficult and sensitive situations to deal with. And, of course, you don't want, you know, family feuds and all that. And I've actually had a couple of family members unfriend me on Facebook because they can't handle you know, some of my political, you know, views on things because uh, they're on the other side. But you're so, so soft-spoken about them. Well, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't just give up who you are and what you believe in, too. Uh, I mean, there's got to be some kind of middle ground. And, All right, yeah. one more question, and we will be available afterwards, so. Uh, my name is Dan Clark, and I'm from Paducah, Kentucky. Why blog instead of blogging through Facebook? Um, because when people, when they're searching information, they don't go to Facebook and search for it. Where do they go? They go to Google. And your blog is then put into that, that sphere. So for me, I've now, um, search engine optimization, high level thing, but uh, thinking about what I put in my keywords, my title of my blogs, when people are saying, what is in milk? How does an organic farmer do this? Whatever, whatever question I think consumers are asking, that's what I put into my blog. So when they go to Google and type that in, hopefully it's my blog that they see first versus PETA's blog. Exactly. But that, that's why I blog. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I have a um, very high level of, is there blood in chocolate milk? It wasn't anything I even thought was a rumor. I get at least 10 searches every day, somebody looking for that information. So I just, I made this post. Is there blood in chocolate? Let's answer that question. And uh, when you do that search, you find my blog and you find 50 blogs that tell you that there are, is blood in chocolate milk, but I'm the number one. It allows for future searchability to sum up what they're saying because I can tell you that um, some of my probably most contentious posts that I wrote three or four years ago about factory farms and people beating cows and wrote them very intentionally for search engines are still searched today. Mm -hmm. um, whereas on Facebook, they won't show up. So the blogging gives you the opportunity for future searchability if people are looking, as Carrie said, for 
blood and chocolate milk, God forbid. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you have perhaps 10 seconds of thoughts, 140 characters, if you will, of final thoughts to offer people? David, go. Uh, just appreciation for being here. I, I love coming to the expo and all the different things I get to see, and thanks for our sponsor, so thank you. I'm a social person, so connect with me online. So if you have any questions, you know, reach out to us, and we'll, we're happy to connect and become friends and followers. One of my favorite quotes, start where you are, do what you can with what you have. Exactly. And I will just leave you with this thought. It's a takeoff of a famous quote. People will forget what you say. They'll forget the perfect sound bite that you've been trained to give. They'll forget how you farm. They will forget the pictures that you share, but they will never, ever forget the way you make them feel. So how are you making people feel about a dairy farmer today? I happen to believe in it, and I've been tweeting and Instagramming and Facebooking up here, so you're all on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram now. Sorry, <laughs> I did take a picture of you all. I happen to believe that social is an incredibly vital tool for us to be able to protect our business in the future. So um, on behalf of the entire panel, thank you to Digistar for having us and World Dairy Expo for hosting us, and hope that you will be around to um, hang out with us afterwards. We are very social. We actually like to talk in person, not just tweet, so please come talk to us. All right, thank you all for coming. Have a great expo.